Forgery Research Chair Professor of Intellectual Property Law, Nirma University, and Visiting Professor of Law, National Law School, Bangalore. He was the founder of several initiatives like Spicy IP, IDIA, Increasing Diversity by Increasing Access to Legal Education, a trust which works on making legal education accessible for underprivileged students, PPIL, and Lex Biosis. Professor Bashir was a Ministry of Human Resource Development Chair Professor of Intellectual Property Law at the West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences, Kolkata, a Frank H. Marks Visiting Associate Professor of Intellectual Property Law at the George Washington University Law School, and a Research Associate at the Oxford Intellectual Studies at the University of Oxford. He completed the BCL as a Shell Centenary Scholar and MPhil with distinction. He is currently doing DPhil as a Wellcome Trust Scholar. In the past, he has been an invited research fellow at the Institute of Intellectual Property Tokyo, International Bar Association, and Inter-Pacific Bar Association. He has been an editor of the Oxford Commonwealth Law Journal Award 2016 by the Society for Indian Law Firms in recognition of the overlapping intellectual property rights Oxford University Press. May I now invite our chief guest, Professor Shammar Bashir, to kindly deliver the convocation address. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. <clears throat> Honorable Chancellor Justice Ramapal, Honorable Governor of Sikkim, Sri Srinivas Patil, Honorable Chief Minister Sri Pavan Chamli, soon to be Dr. Chamli, Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor T.B. Supa, Registrar Sri T.K. Kaul, and other distinguished dignitaries. My dear student graduates and other awardees who are just minutes away from receiving your hard earned, well earned degrees. And lastly, dear parents, well wishers, and other members in this August audience. Uh, firstly, as you can see, I'm having a little bit of trouble balancing this on my head. Uh, and I mentioned that this is a true test of balance. If you can pass this, you will lead a balanced life for the rest of the time that you're out of here. Um, so I'm being put to the test now, as I can imagine. Um, I must thank your Vice Chancellor uh, and your Chancellor for inviting me here to deliver this uh, address on such a momentous occasion. Uh, it is, as you can imagine, the first for me. Um, and I, I, I really didn't want to disappoint, so uh, I ended up working around four to five different themes and discarding all of them, telling myself that this wasn't good enough, what we call in India in this colloquial country of ours, Kyan. The Kyan wasn't good enough uh, because I was supposed to deliver something uh, of import, of meaning that you can take back with you uh, as you receive your degrees and step out into this complex and uncertain world. And I finally settled on a fifth one. Uh, which, uh, I, which I hope uh, will resonate uh, with some of you. Uh, and I hope that the message that, that I'm about to deliver today uh, will not just be for those who are receiving their degrees today, but uh, will sort of encompass a wider audience uh, uh, and the fond, and perhaps even the vain hope, uh, is that it would serve as a manifesto of sorts uh, to rethink our educational paradigm. Uh, because God knows there are several problems with the educational structure as we know it today. Uh, and uh, what I want to focus on is really getting back to the basics uh, and rewiring our educational uh, ecosystem uh, in, in, in some ways. And if perchance, all my rumblings, long-winded rumblings and rants, uh, because as you know, we lawyers, your vice chancellor made the mistake of inviting a lawyer to speak to you today because we love the word, to hear our own voice. And so we ramble on and on. Um, so I want to make sure that uh, I keep it short and crisp, uh, but if at all it doesn't leave a mark, please remember that the last words before you receive your degree were those of mine, um, and lawyers love having the last word. Uh, so what I've tried doing is drawing on my own background as a lawyer, as a law professor, as an educator, and, and then trying to mesh all this up uh, into a theme uh, that I hope will resonate with some of you, uh, and there will be a fair bit of metaphysics as well because I dabble in that as well. Um, so to begin with, uh, I'm going to do this through a narrative of storytelling, uh, because uh, obviously that's more interesting.
that's more engaging. Uh, and as the great political poet, a very profound poet, uh, Muriel Rukaisa said a long time ago, for all you science students out there working hard at your labs, the universe is not made up of atoms, it is made up of stories. And so what better to help understand the universe than through storytelling? And I want to narrate around four to five stories, big stories, uh, to get my message across to you. So I start with my first story. Uh, and it began with the invention of the stereoscope. You know, the little instrument that you see dangling around the neck of a doctor. At least most of us that grew up in a certain era identified the doctor with the stereoscope. Unfortunately, today, for today's generation, you don't see the stereoscope anymore. What you have is the digital patient where the doctor is pulling up records on the computer and just looking at your digital data and then prescribing a very healthy cocktail of drugs. Uh, we've lost a sense of touch. Doctors don't touch you anymore. They don't feel you anymore. They don't get an assessment of what it is that ails you, uh, but they've got standardized regimens. Uh, but this was 1816, and in 1816, the doctors still believed uh, that they would diagnose you best if they heard your heartbeat. And the way to hear your heartbeat then was by actually placing your ear close to the bosom of the patient. Now, in 1816, there was a certain doctor called Dr. René uh, Lanek, who was a very shy doctor, and his patient happened to be a very ample bosom lady. So the shy doctor was very averse to putting his ear close to her bosom to hear the heartbeat. And he was in a bit of a perplexity and wondering what to do. And then he recalled that some months ago, as he was walking by a little park, there were a group of children playing. And one child had a hollow stick, you know, a long stick, cylindrical stick with a hollow inside, and was making a slight scraping noise at one end of the stick. And the noise was amplifying at the other end because it's a hollow. For all you science students out there, you know, when you have a hollow, when you have a sound at one end, it amplifies at the other end. And the doctor brought that back to his memory and said, my God, this is it. So he went back to his patient, rolled up a piece of paper, and put it against her chest, and then held the other piece of paper to his ear, and thus was born this telescope. Of course, he built a good prototype because he was also a hobby carpenter, and he, was, he played the flute as well. So he made the first contraption of what is known as the stereoscope. And the reason I narrate the story is because it's actually a beautifully simple idea, but a beautifully simple idea that came, came through the powers of observation, of a doctor who was walking down the street, happened to observe children, looked at them, and then connected the dots at a later point in time. In fact, most of creativity, most of the best inventions that we see around us, most of society's progress, is from observations of this sort. And yet today, will our medical students, will our doctors walking down the street be able to come up with something like this? And that's the challenge I pose before you. If you look at the typical doctor today or the typical medical student today, they are not going to observe children playing on the street because they're on their phones, smartphones they call them. The irony of course is that those phones will be dumber than ever as electronic slaves to their rings, notifications and beeps. And of course, you use those phones to connect to the social networks, which again, ironically, a paradox, you be more antisocial than ever. You see a nice little table with a family out there sitting there or on their smartphones, accessing their different social networks, becoming dumber and more antisocial. And that's the tragedy of the era that we live in today. So clearly no medical student is going to be observing children in the street, but more importantly, there are no children in the street playing anymore. They're all inside the houses playing on the iPads, iPods, and all the electronic gadgets, right? Apple is no longer a beautiful, nice, healthy fruit for them. <laughs> it's an electronic device and a great brand. So the short point of my story is simply this, that the stereoscope came into existence thanks to a very mindful and observant doctor who was able to get his creative juices flowing and was able to connect the dots. And that's why we really need to get, if we need to make some, and that's why the education system needs uh, to be at, rather than flinging more and more information down your way and tiring you out with information, can we leave some space for you to actually make these connections, to observe, to be mindful? You know, the greatest of all known detectives, Sherlock Holmes, who many of you may be familiar with, once told Dr. Watson, his sidekick, that Watson, the reason I'm able to solve most of these murder mysteries is because I observe, whereas you only see. Right? You see, but I observe. And observation lies at, at, at the heart of many of us. I don't know how many of you read about a dreadful series of deaths in Muzaffarpur, in Bihar, 
where a number of children for the last 15 years or so were dying each summer, were falling off like flies. And it took the researchers, scientists and doctors a good almost 10 years to figure out what the problem was. But again, because of observation, they realized that the kids were dying because they were eating lychees. Now, you would never imagine that lychees could cause death. But in this case, it was an excessive number of lychees. Muzaffarpur is actually the lychee hop of India. It produces the most, no, I'm sorry, I'm still having problems balancing. Um, I can take it off. Thank you very much. Spot use word now. Um, so lychees, uh, Muzaffarpur is known for its production of lychees, the highest stuff. And the children would just feast on the lychees because lychees are available in plenty. And because they ate lychees during the day, they would not have dinner at night. So the body starves at night, there's glucose starvation. And in the morning again, they went back and had the lychees. And lychees now, interestingly, they found out, had a rare protein called uh, hypoglycin, which inhibited glucose production even more. So low glucose because of lack of food, lack of dinner. Mm -hmm. Lychees because of a protein that inhibited glucose production even more. Brain damage, brain death, and then the kids died. But it took them all of 10 years, but it took very careful paths of observation to actually stitch this together. And because of these paths of observation, you now have the kids uh, in the summer in Muzaffarpur staying safe and healthy. Unfortunately, as I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, today uh, we need to struggle really hard to get our students and to get all of you to be mindful and in the moment. Today, we have an era of what I call the information atyachar era. You're being bombarded and assaulted by information from all sides. From your phones, from your television, from your lectures, from your newspapers, mainstream media, the nation wants to know, etc. Et we all want it, all the time. Useless information. And this pollutes us and pollutes our mind, leaving us very little scope for original thinking, for basic thinking. And that is a, is a real tra tragedy. So how do we begin to redress this? And this will be the core of my message. That the only way we can get rid of this atyachar that is being inflicted upon us is by saying enough is enough. Less is more. Let's have less information, please. And less is more, or minimalism as we call it, is a simple philosophy. It has roots in Buddhism, in Zen Buddhism particularly, uh, in a lot of our ancient scriptures. And it's being touted by a number of people, but followed by very few. So how do we follow it today? In this era, where we feast a lot and we fast a lot less, consumerism is one of our greatest curses. We're being, we're wired effectively to want more and more, to crave more and more, because that's how markets run. Markets run on the strength of your wants and desires. And in fact, yesterday, I was uh, telling one of your professors, uh, Jigme, uh, who was escorting me uh, from the airport, uh, that this age of consumerism is so beautifully put in a shot. I think it was a posting made by a friend of mine on Twitter saying that, you know, strangely enough, I woke up to two crows fighting over a toothbrush. And he said, the last I recall, crows never brush their teeth. In fact, they don't have teeth. The reason they're fighting over a toothbrush is because consumerism has caught onto them as well. We buy things we don't want. And that, unfortunately, is the tragedy of our times. We acquire more and more, despite the fact that we don't want it. And I tell my students all the time that most of the world's problems are not creational problems. We don't need to create more. We just need to distribute more. We have enough. Gandhiji put it beautifully once that we have enough for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. And that is the true tragedy of our times. Now, of course, we have a set of people in Japan, in America, and other places following a philosophy called minimalism. And they say, well, we want to reduce the pollution in our lives. We want less consumer goods. We want less material possessions because it makes us feel happier and healthier. So now they're going back to three sets of clothes, one cupboard, one small house, small rooms, no cars, just public transport. And they're finding it makes their lives far better. Steve Jobs hailed as one of the greatest inventors ever. And some of you may have heard this story. Completely emptied out his wardrobe. Left himself with just a pair of jeans, blue pair of jeans, a black t-shirt, and white sneakers. And when somebody asked him, so why do you wear the same clothes each day? Because he must have had different pairs of it. 
otherwise you'll be singing. Um, but he wore the same color combination. And he said, well, it's one less decision for me. And I don't want to spend time deciding on what clothes to wear each morning. I want to spend time deciding what is going to be the computer of the future. So all his time was spent deciding on those iconoclastic inventions that we see today, the iPad, the iPod, the beautiful Apple Macintosh, because he wants to reduce time. And same, if you look at some of the others that have picked up, Mark Zuckerberg, and many leaders across, even Obama, what the, have the same color suit. And they say because psychologists call it decision fatigue. That every day you're faced with having to make so many choices. And I learned this firsthand on my first trip to the United States many, many years ago. I went in the morning to kickstart my batteries to recharge. In the morning you want to start off the day nicely with a nice cup of coffee. And I went in and asked for a nice cup of coffee. And the person says, well, how do you like it, sir? Would you like a macchiato, latte, mochaccino, chocaccino, <laughs> cappuccino? <laughs> and how do you like it? With milk, soya milk, almond milk, regular milk, <laughs> semi-skim, skim, fully skim, sugar, white, brown, black, blue, sugar free. And I said, my God, a cup of coffee has never been more painful. <laughs> become a curse. <laughs> and that's the tragedy, that too much choice leads to decision fatigue, not always a good thing. And apparently Starbucks today is even better. Starbucks, the one that dispenses all these coffee and it goes to Starbucks and enter then. Now apparently there are 80,000 different permutations and combinations of beverages that are being sold out of these cafes. You can imagine the kind of fatigue cognitive indecision uh, that you will undergo once you step into one of these places. And of course, like I said, uh, this goes back to ancient Indian philosophy, it goes back uh, to some of the things that the Buddhists and the Zen Buddhists and many others had said, uh, that it's always better to live minimalistically, uh, because that enables you to look inwards, and that enables you to lead a much happier life. And consumerism, the biggest attack on this excessive consumerism came many years ago. And I would recommend that we all go back and read that book again. It's a beautiful piece of work. And written almost in a stream of consciousness fashion. Very informally written, easy to follow, easy to understand by Schumacher. Leading <coughs> economist, philosopher, very wise sage. And it's called Small is Beautiful. It's not just economics, it's philosophy. It's on the education system. He has a lot of messages for our education ecosystem as well. And a lot of what he said resonates uh, with what uh, Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, the European one said, that the snake that cannot shed its skin must die. If you cannot shed your skin, you must die. You will die. And yet, what do we do? We go on acquiring more and more skin and polluting ourselves further. So how do we get rid of, rid of the skin, of this excess? I propose that we start with a fast, and a digital fast of that. Shut off all digital devices, shut off all smartphones, shut off all the information feed that comes to you for at least a single day in a week. In that day, tell yourself, no, the nation doesn't want to know. <laughs> We're happy not knowing today. Because it is this knowledge that's creating the problem. It is this information overdose that's creating the problem. We speak about environmental pollution, and yet we never speak about mental pollution. The fact that your mind gets toxic with so much information. But unless you clean up your mind, how can you ever hope to solve the other kinds of pollution, such as environmental pollution? Solutions always come. The best solutions across history, across time, have come from those with an uncluttered mind, unpolluted mind. Almost like a tabula rasa, a blank slate. And that's going to be my next story, as to how a person, a genius with a blank state, was able to give us one of the most enduring legal concepts and principles. Like I said, I might be borrowing from the law, but I will put it in a way that most of you understand it, so you don't need to run away from it because it's legal. Uh, it's, 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 it's a legal example, but I, I hope that you will understand it, because it cuts across. Uh, it's a lesson that cuts across all disciplines. So many, many centuries ago, 
they lived a very wise legal philosopher called Hugo Grotius. Very talented, all of 21 years old, he was commissioned by the then Dutch East India Company to sort out something called the law of the sea. They had a law of the land then, but no law of the sea. And the Dutch were at a loss because they were a small trading nation. The biggest powers during those times that controlled the seas were the Portuguese and the Spanish. And their form of control was very simple. They would just, whichever part of the sea they could dock their ships in and have people patrolling, they said, we exercise dominion over these seas and we control this and this belongs to us. The Dutch couldn't pass through without paying a huge toll. The Dutch couldn't engage in the spice trade that was then the most lucrative trade. And so they commissioned Hugo Grotius and said, can you get us a sensible law of the sea? So Grotius had to satisfy his corporate clients because the Dutch East India Company was one of the first corporations as we know it. In fact, it is the world's first corporation. They even issued um, something similar to modern day shares uh, to their stakeholders in those days. But he also had to arrive at something that was fair, that would work for all countries. And all he had to go with was the law of the land, the law of real property. Some ancient Roman scriptures on Roman law or natural law. And when he looked at the law of the land, he found that with law, land, it was fairly simple. Whoever exercises dominion over land, if you fence the land, you put your stake there and you say, this is my land, well, that's yours. You could mark off the land. Grotius said, you can't do that for the seas. Because the sea can't be fenced. The sea flows, water flows. In fact, he went, goes into the chemical properties of water and says, water flows, it cannot be bounded, it cannot be fenced in. So water should be free for all to use. And that's why we got the, the concept of the freedom of the seas. If you know, for those of you who are slightly familiar with this, the seas or the high seas do not belong exclusively to any nation. They're free for all nations to use. Of course, there are some checks and balances so that somebody doesn't use it uh, excessively, somebody doesn't exploit it excessively. But the notion is that it belongs to the common heritage of mankind, that it's free for all of us except a small body of water called the coastal waters or the territorial waters. But that's with a view to controlling your own land better. You need a little bit of water just outside your land if you're a coastal state, so that you control the land better. That you can exercise exclusive dominion of. But otherwise, the open seas are open and free for everyone to use. Now this is what I call a beautiful piece of legal ingenuity, legal creativity. Taking a concept that existed and then adapting it to suit a new situation and as your chancellor will tell you, who's, who uh, was on the bench and came up with many a decision of a similar sort, but this is the beauty of what we call common law. It's incremental progress, it's legal creativity, where you're adapting it, but you're adapting it sensibly and creatively to a new circumstance, a new situation. So Grotius essentially, fortunately, didn't have Facebook Twitter, Gmail, Times of India. He had only these ancient, you know, maybe a couple of textbooks. But he, he read them. There were very few that he could go with. But he reflected a lot. So my message to you is very simple. That not always good when you read more. In fact, sometimes it may help to read less, but reflect more on what you've read. And you don't need to read everything. Read the basics, the foundational basics. We need to go back to the basics. And I think that's what's going to get us in this war. You know, in this era where we talk about skilling and employability, and you acquire more and more skills and more and more information, I think we need to turn the clock back. Rather than acquiring more and more peripheral and information that constitutes a superstructure, let's go back to the basics. Let's go back to the substructure. Because most of creativity, most of the solutions to today's problems are really going to come back from the fundamentals, the building blocks. That will enable you to play around much more, that will enable you to be more creative as you go out into the world. And we need to focus on the core, on the building blocks. And I'll give you one story of my own personal example. You see, many, many years ago, I was into very heavy duty bodybuilding. Doesn't look like it now, uh, but believe me when I say this, I had a very athletic frame. And I invested a lot of time uh, doing a lot of research into how to build the body in the quickest possible way. I had a very good trainer who on the first day told me that you need to focus on the core, C-O-R-E. And I said, what's the core of the body? I said, isn't everything the core? The arms, the legs, the body, the chest, everything is the core of the body. He said, no. 
The core muscles are the basic foundational muscles of your body, which lend the stability and balance to the body. If you build those and you develop those, you can develop the others much better, the peripheral is much better. And a great example is a muscle, for those of you familiar with biology, is the transversus abdominis. It's an abdominal muscle somewhere midpoint between your navel and your lower back. Many people don't know about this. And I said focus on that because that lends a lot of stability to your body. And if you can make that very strong and stable, you can lift a lot more weights and you can work out the other muscles much, much better. And when I was thinking through the speech and I said, my God, I should pull that example back in because that's exactly what we need for our educational ecosystem. That we need to go back to the building blocks, the core, and leave the peripherals for the students themselves to build on. What do we do instead? We end up teaching more of the peripherals in our classroom, in a one-way transmission of information through this beautiful lecture method, and we leave out a large part of the basics. I'm sure many of you may have heard of Elon Musk, one of the leading entrepreneurs today, very creative, traverses several different disciplines, came up with the first electric car, Tesla, is now building something called a hyperloop with pods that can travel at huge speeds through loops that will then cut out all the time that you waste in traffic. Is planning a mission to Mars, to colonize Mars. So it's got some crazy ideas. And also things very interestingly, for those of you who are into metaphysics, that the world is a simulated reality. And it's not just him, the Bank of America endorsed it and said there's a 50% chance that the world is a simulated reality and we're, leave, we're living somebody else's simulation, uh, even as we speak. But anyway, short point is, Musk was asked once, a lot of Musk was asked, how do you keep in touch with so many different disciplines and come up with these fabulous inventions? How do you acquire so much of knowledge? Because he's reading all, all the time and he's so familiar with so many different disciplines and he's able to mix and match and come up with these smart ideas. And Musk said, and I quote, it is important to view knowledge as a sort of a semantic tree. Make sure you understand the fundamental principles. That's the trunk of the tree and the big branches. Before you get into the leaves and the details, if not, there is nothing for the leaves or the minor information to hang on to. Unless you build the trunk, you can't put the leaves anywhere. So all the leaves that you acquire, you have nothing to put it on to. It's just wafting freely in the wind and dispersing, making no impact in the way that you process in the way that you think, in the way that you arrive at grand themes and concepts. And that's what's missing in our current ecosystem. Not just in education, but across. When you go out into your workplace, you'll find the same thing. Elon Musk is doing this in the real world. He's not doing it in a college. But he's building this because you need to build your knowledge, you need to build the blocks, you need to build the semantic tree. Because education is a lifelong endeavor. And we're all hoping to better ourselves. And I hope that is our quest to better ourselves, to flower to our fullest potential and to blossom to our fullest potential. As Abraham Maslow once said, uh, to self-actualize in the best way, to become the best that we can. And for that we need to constantly engage and, and constantly uh, revisit uh, some of our, the ways in which we learn uh, and the ways in which we progress. And if we focus on the core of the foundational building blocks, the advantage is that the teacher's task also becomes much easier. Because if the teacher is paired, and this is a question I always get, you know, when I go back and give this huge feel about going back to basics and getting the fundamentals into the students in a strong way, the first reaction of most faculty members is, but we don't have time. We can't cover our syllabus. And I take a look, and the subject that I'm most familiar with is intellectual property law. And we have something called patents, the Patents Act. And they say, well, we have 180 sections to cover in the Patents Act. And I say, well, why do you need to teach 180 sections in the Patents Act? You only teach 180 sections to your students. Teach them five broad concepts and patterns. They will read and pick up the rest. And that should be the education end of it. That we have to focus on the basics, that leaves, the informational leaves, the students can grow them on their own. We help them just build the strong trunk of the tree and the strong roots. The rest they will put on themselves. So the teacher's time is also spent. In fact, if you go one step further, Socrates had a beautiful theory that the teacher doesn't need to do much because all the knowledge is inherent within the student. 
right? This is a, a one theory of epistemology that everything that we need to know about the outside world is already inside. The teacher's job is then to draw it out, which makes it even simpler. Right? Spend less time. It's already there. I don't need to keep pumping you with information. I can draw it out. And Socrates demonstrated this with a slave in those days, uneducated, black slave. Through a series of questions, Socrates was able to get the slave to arrive at what we now know as the Pythagoras theorem. That is, the square of the hypotenuse would equal the squares of two sides, two other sides, of a right angle triangle. Now this you and I learned in school. Some of us find it, I found it difficult initially. And, 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 and as many will tell you, lawyers tend to run away from maths and graphs and things of that sort. But Socrates was able to draw it out of a slate because it was a fundamental truth, an innate mathematical wisdom that's already inherent. All it needed was a pulling out. And I would suggest that we need to take the educational system back there. There was a beautiful poet again that I just recently discovered called Naira Wahid. I think she's a poetess of what I call metaphorical minimalism. So a great example to use today when we talk about minimalism, because she says the most profound things in the least number of words, and in the most beautiful poetry. And her line was, the greatest teacher will send you back to yourself. The greatest teacher will send you back to yourself, to find yourself. And that's the basic thing, how do we find ourselves? How do we get a sense of the self? Because everything is inside. Swami Vivekananda, who many of you are familiar with, again expressed it beautifully, of course in a little more verbose manner, but he says no knowledge comes from outside, it's all inside. Where what we say a man knows should in strict psychological language be what he discovers or unveils. What a man learns is really what he discovers. By taking the cover of his own soul, which is a mine of infinite knowledge. And unfortunately, a sense of self is the last thing that our educational paradigm ends up doing today. It gives you everything else, it feeds you with enough stuff about the outside world, but with very less to seek inside and to get a sense of the self or a sense of purpose. What the Japanese call ikiga. Unless you have a sense of purpose, there's no point. And I think there was a beautiful book called The Little Prince. I can't pronounce uh, the author's name. <coughs> Saint Exupere, something. Uh, those of you familiar with French names, you can pronounce it better. But the little princess is beautiful sentence saying, if I want you to build a ship, I will not divide you up into teams and say, you gather the wood, you screw on the screws, you bring in the engine. I won't do that. I will tell all my team, I will make them yearn for the seas. So if I want to build a ship, I make them yearn for the seas. I give them a sense of purpose. That the seas are out there, the beautiful majestic seas. They will then do the job on their own, build the best beautiful ship there is. But if you tell them, build the ship in X, Y, Z way, you know, get the wood, get the engine, get the, you'll find that they may do a decent job, but not an exceptional job. So purpose, very, very important to give you a sense of purpose. And knowledge of the self, again, Khalil Gibran, philosopher, poet, said it again. Knowledge of the self is the most important knowledge. It's the mother of all knowledge. So it is incumbent to me to know the self, to know it completely, to know its minutiae, its characteristics, its subtleties, and its very attitudes. And that brings me to my next story, that how do we try and go back to the self? And what are the attributes that we want when we go back to the self? Now my connection with the Northeast is a deep and lasting one, I hope so which is why I jumped at this invitation. I'm very thankful to your Vice Chancellor and Chancellor and all the other dignitaries who invited me here. In 2010, I came to a beautiful place called Delhi. I was then teaching in Calcutta at a university called the National University of Theoretical Sciences. <coughs> and I began teaching there in part uh, due uh, to the fact that your Chancellor here uh, played a role in persuading me at that stage uh, to leave a job in the United States and come back and contribute in to institution building in India, uh, along with a very visionary vice chancellor called Professor M.P. Singh, who's one of the leading constitutional law scholars here today. And as luck would have it, uh, our Northeast connection also began together because 
In 2010, I came here with a group of students to a small government school in Penn, wanting to find out how many students want to do law, particularly from underprivileged backgrounds, because we found in our law school, there were hardly any underprivileged students. This was one of the top law, three law schools in the country. I was teaching a course for plant variety protection law. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but if you come up with a new seed or a new breed, uh, you can claim protection under this legislation. Uh, so it's a legislation that governs a lot of agriculture and breeding techniques and seeds, etc. I was teaching that to my class, and I asked them, how many of you are familiar with an agricultural field? I had 50 students, very bright students. And I said, familiar means not just that you've seen it, but you know something about agriculture. Not a single hand went down. And I said, my God, we have a real problem in our own backyard. We teach the Constitution of India, we teach uh, equality, social justice, inclusion, and all these fancy terms and themes, but we have a real problem in our own law school where severely exclusionary, we are elitist. We don't have a single student that is familiar with an agricultural field. Because out of the 100 students, we did a survey, and we found that just one went to a school in a rural area. All the others were educated in urban centers. Only one studied in a school that had a vernacular medium. Education, all the others were English medium adequate. And we said, well, they're not going to come to us. We need to go to them. And so we started right here in Pelly, in a Dublin school, wondering if we can entice some students to the study of law. Out of 100 students, of course, not a single one wanted to do law, because law by then had a bad reputation thanks to uh, Bollywood and several other factors. Right? You see the nice image of the lawyer as a pimp and a tout, and anybody who will bend the rules and bend morals to get what, what, to get what they want. And we began a mission of correcting that slowly, picking up students and training them. And the idea was that we pick up people from the bottom of the pyramid, underprivileged students, and train them to become leading lawyers. So we put them in the top law schools. And it wasn't just about the law. It wasn't just about helping them gain employment. It was about building community leaders. Because we thought the law had a very strong nexus with leadership. And our freedom struggle is ample proof of that. Look at all our freedom fighters from the yesteryears. Mahatma Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, all trained in the law. But because of their training in the law, they could articulate they could advocate their campaigns. They could persuade. And just yesterday at the hotel, we went slightly late, so we were not entitled to the buffet. But your faculty member here who was escorting me, uh, she did a fantastic job of persuading them, persuading us to partake in the casino buffet at the same price. And I said, my God, here's a, here's a good lawyer. This is what we do daily, on a daily basis, persuade, convince. I we said, what better way to create community leaders than create people and give them the skill sets in persuading and convincing? And what better way to feel, speak about diversity? Because we wanted to bring in diversity into the law schools. We said, these are all the same kind of students. While they're bright, they're really poor in their imagination and their thinking because they're getting to hear the same kind of viewpoints. They're talking to the same kind of people with a similar background. They will never grow. In order to grow, you need to speak and be in the company of people that think very differently from you. Otherwise, you'll get what Facebook and Twitter and all these things are showing, shoving down your throat these days. These have become eco chambers. You get to read the same thing that you like. You get the friends that echo the views that you like. You become impoverished. You're never able to think a distinct thought. You get too comfortable in the idea of comfort. And we wanted to break that, bring in more diversity, and we said, what better way than to start here in the Northeast? which represents one of the highest degrees of diversity ever known in terms of food, culture, peoples, plants, vegetation, flora, fauna, anything. Eclectic mix, wonderful mix. And we've come some way, of course, since then, now it's 2016. We had, uh, out of the six students we trained from Pelling, the first day of one made it. He's now a qualified lawyer practicing in Delhi. And then we branched out to other parts of the Northeast. Then we went all over India. Now we're in 23, 25 different states. But one of the problems we always face is, what kind of lawyers do we want to create? Are we happy with just putting them into the law schools? Because the law schools, unfortunately, many of them don't ask the question, what kind of lawyers do we want to create? They're very content being formalistic and ticking off the right boxes. The Bar Council of India says, you need to study X, Y, Z courses. You need to have X number of faculty, X number of classes. And so long as we tick the boxes, we're fine. The UGC says, again, boxes, we tick off the boxes. Yet, have we asked the question, what is the purpose? You know, my vice chancellor at NUJS, Professor M.P. Singh, had this beautiful paradigm, which I still carry with me. And he'll say, don't open the Bar Council of India rules right now. Do not open the UGC right now. 
let's have a discussion on how to educate our children in the best way possible. How to create leading lawyers of tomorrow. Once we arrive at how to do this, then let's look at the UGC. Let's look at the Bar Council. And then let's use our training as lawyers to creatively interpret those to make sure we fit in. That's what you said in the Bible. Because I can tell you from personal experience that the Bar Council has no idea what they're doing when they formulate legal education rules. It's a tragedy. It's a sure tragedy. There's no thinking that goes into it. And so, when we started the idea of fundamental misuses, how do we create exceptional lawyers? People that can become leaders. And I think that should be our goal. That we don't just educate, we create the leaders of tomorrow. How do we create that? And so we study leading lawyers across the years. From the legal firmament, of course. We study the top lawyers, law professors, judges, Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Barack Obama, Etzele <coughs> Hart, leading jurist, philosopher, Lord Tenney, one of the greatest judges. And we found that there were about five attributes or traits that are common to these leading figures. They were all creative. So we put the C in there. They were all holistic in their orientation. They would not be symptomatic like a modern day physicians. You got a pain, well, here's a painkiller. Well, what's causing the pain, well, we don't care. Well, we don't want that. We want people that would get to the root of the problem and wipe it out. And same with law. We don't want symptomatic lawyers. We we'll just wipe out the symptoms because the underlying conflict will then remain. How do we solve the conflict? From the root, from the bottom. Holistics, H. We want lawyers that would be altruistic. Because altruism is a very important feature of law. And that's why many of us got into the legal profession because we wanted to help. We wanted to advocate somebody's cause. So how do we, how do we get the altruism back? We wanted mavericks, M. People who would not just blindly follow convention but would challenge it. And as luck would have it, when I researched this topic, I found that the term Maverick came from Samuel Maverick, who happened to be a lawyer. <coughs> Interesting. And P.S. Problem solvers. We want true problem solvers. The law was meant to be about problem solving. Unfortunately, today lawyers have become problem aggravators, keeping the cases pending in court so they earn more money, but failing to resolve the problems and failing to do anything. Of course, now there's a movement called Alternative Dispute Resolution, which is trying to get lawyers to be more problem solvers go less to court and get the parties uh, to resolve the disputes through negotiation and mediation and uh, things like that outside, outside the court. So C-H-A-M-P-S, these were the attributes, and it's nicely abbreviated to CHAMPS. So we said, okay, we'll start a CHAMPS project, and we'll make sure that every scholar that we pick up, underprivileged scholar, and train through our program, which is called IDIA, Increasing Diversity by Increasing Access to Education will be infused with these characteristics. If not within the law schools, at least outside. So we bring them outside the law school and we run programs through the year for them to infuse each one of these traits. And these traits are important, not just for the law, but for the whole other disciplines as well. Take creativity, for example. It is an absolute imperative in today's world. The world is getting more complex and uncertain. So we have to prepare our students, for the complexity and the uncertainty, not for a life of comfort. And yet what our education system does and what our parents do is pushing children more and more into risk averse domains. Steady salaries, steady jobs that command a good premium in the market, steady brides and bridegrooms that you might get if you got a good, nice job. And those are the sort of steady, comfortable, secure, risk averse pathways that both our schools, colleges, and our parents want us to lead into. And we've lost that creative spark. I still recall uh, Edward de Bono had a beautiful book called uh, Lateral Thinking, which I was reading uh, on the eve of my 10th standard exam, because somebody gave it to me. And my teacher snatches it. It's called Lateral Thinking. I said, first learn to think literally, then you can think of lateral. And I said, that's the problem. That we force our students to think literally all the time, but no lateral. In the law, we have more literal lawyers who can read the case law and split hairs about what each term in that case or legislation means. Very literal, but hardly any lateral thinking. The lawyers that would force us to open up our paradigms, to bust it open, to, re to question our fundamental assumptions, to break open our black and white boxes, because we are comfortable with black, black and white boxes. That leads to bigotry and all sorts of things, and we're seeing it play out in the country today, that we want the country black and white. 
We refuse to see the pluralism, we refuse to see the diversity, we refuse to see the shades of grey, because they make us uncomfortable. We want certainty. Not realizing that the world is hardly certain. And you could walk out of this hall and who knows? Could be a coconut falling on your head. The end. The last speech you ever heard. God forbid. What do we test for in our classes? We test for something called convergent intelligence, a very narrow form of intelligence. Convergent thinking. We have to converge on the right answer. Right? Your entrance exam may have objective type answers where there's one correct answer. In the law as well, we tend to focus on the one correct answer in our papers. And yet, most of the psychologists and the others, for those of you, and I notice a number of you are getting degrees across various disciplines, which is great, which is why I thought this theme would be a great fit for you because there's a lot of psychology and anthropology and other things uh, messed into this talk. But the psychologists would tell us that creativity comes from divergent things. Not from convergent thinking. So when I start my classes, I go with a piece, I go with a pen that I normally have, and I whip out my pen, and I say, what can you do with this pen? Right? Give me all the things that you can do with this pen. And then the students, of course, the first answer is, oh, we'll write and we'll do this. And then they start to get more creative. Well, if I have an itch in my back, I'll scratch using the pen. If I'm a lady, well, I go out to bring my little stick to put my, my hair bun in, so I'll stick it there. And somebody more creative says, well, I can use it to save a life. Because if somebody gets a breathing problem because there's something stuck in the throat, I can perform what is called, and I hope I'm getting the pronunciation right, cricothyroidotomy, which is you make a little incision with a knife and you put the barrel of a pen so you can breathe through that. It's an, apparently it works really well. And I thought, uh, well, this is an outlandish idea. It was an outlandish idea, it was great. But there's also a paper written about this. Right? And it's called bystander cricothyroidotomy using household devices such as the pen. A fresh academic feasibility study. If you thought academics uh, wrote on interesting topics, this is it. Right? Einstein, actually not Einstein, somebody else made this quote, but people wrongly attribute it to Einstein because then it gets more circulation. Um, but this the quote goes like this. Everybody is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its entire life believing that it's stupid. And that's what we do in our classrooms, right? We test them all by the same narrow yardstick of intelligence, convergent thinking, forgetting that intelligence itself is of multiple types. The Howard, uh, Howard Gardner, who's, the, who's a Harvard education psychologist, came up with this beautiful theory of multiple intelligences. In the early days, he said intelligence is not just your normal cognitive lo logical intelligence, uh, your standard form of IQ intelligence, but it's also a dance form of intelligence, you know, bodily intelligence. Kinesthetics, dance and sportsmen have a side of music intelligence. Now he expands into spiritual intelligence, existential intelligence, emotional intelligence. And we need to inculcate a lot of these within our students. So I've been told that my time is running out, so I'm going to come to my last point and my last story. There's one more story in there called Think Less and Imagine More, but you can read that. It's one of my favorite stories on, a, again, a precocious child called William Perkins who discovered the first die. But we'll skip that, and I will go straight to my last point, which is less worldliness and more wisdom. Now, Rumi, who's, one, who's a great uh, Sufi saint uh, from Konya, uh, medieval Arabia, uh, now in modern-day modern -day Turkey, had this beautiful sentiment saying, yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today I'm wise, so I'm changing myself. And that's what we need, more you know, a little more wisdom and less worldliness. Before we get there and try to impact the world, let's go inside so that we impact ourselves first. And this is the story I'll end on. Mahatma Gandhi running very rapidly to catch a train. And as he ran, he caught the train, but one of the sandals fell off onto the railway tracks. Without batting an eyelid, he takes off his other sandal and throws it on the track, thinking that, anyway, I've lost a sandal. I've got only one sandal. Let somebody else benefit. So I throw my other sand. That's almost instinctive. It's an act of creative compassion, but instinctive, so deeply wired in. And this, one of my friends who was investigating what it means to be wise, he said this is the most exalted form of wisdom. The understanding that we're all one, that we're all connected. And many people have said this. Martin Luther, Martin Luther King also, the king follower of Gandhi said, injustice anyway is a threat to justice everywhere. That we're all connected. So let's work at repairing everyone's problem, treating the other as our own. The Africans express it beautifully, Ubuntu. I am, because we are. We're all connected. So independence can't be achieved without really understanding that we're all interdependent. 
And it is this interdependency, I think, that is key uh, to a lot of how uh, we, we begin to shape the future. We can get rid of our own suffering by helping others with their suffering. And this sentiment, many have recorded, but Charles Darwin surprisingly recorded as well. We're compelled to relieve the suffering of another in order that our own painful feelings may at the same time be relieved. So I've rambled enough, so let me end with this. I think in today's COP we have a number of problems, but less is going to be more. So we need to lynch less and love a lot more. We need to transcend the petty politics of caste, creed, religion, region. If we don't do that, we can never claim to have evolved from the Ipsis Darwin set. We, didn't, we never evolved, I think we've devolved. It's a devolution. And for the, all of you who've earned your stellar stripes today, and your degrees, if nothing else stays with you, at least let this piece of metaphysical musing say that if we are to make a mark in this world, I think the first journey we have is going to be inwards, to seek the self, to understand that we're part of a larger cosmic consciousness. You can spend your entire life thinking that you're a drop in the ocean and you can keep perfecting yourself as a drop in the ocean. Or you can decide that you are the ocean itself. Dissolve into the ocean. Dissolve into that larger cosmic consciousness. And then you will watch the magic unfold because then nothing is impossible. Then you need, need not get the leaves of information because then you become boundless. You realize that the infinite capacity, the worldly wisdom, everything is deep, deeply resonant within. So let's find a way to get everyone back, back to the inside back to ourselves, because that's the only way we beat what now are the biggest threat that everyone seems to be echoing, namely artificial intelligence of the machines. Because at least till now, machines don't have consciousness, they don't have self-awareness, they don't have a sense of the self, they can't connect with interdependence, at least not yet. So we're safe for the moment, my very best wishes to all of you as you walk out into this world, uh, and thank you very much again uh, for hearing me. Thank you. I present to you